everybody. Welcome back to the Brandon Joe podcast. Our guest today is Matt Camerata. He is currently receiving his graduate degree in IO psychology from Hofstra University along Brandon and I. Has previous experience as a consulting intern at Compass Workforce Solutions and is also the treasurer of IOPSA, our own club at, or yeah, club, is that the right term? Club, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> club at uh, in our for our master's program. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome. Cool. Thank you for having me, guys. You know, my longtime listener, first time guest, so this is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> we love it um for i, I kind of said it in the intro but matt is in our um our year in our master's program um brandon and i personally worked with him in a couple of projects um overall love the guy so i'm excited for this episode because it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun we have a lot of fun things to talk about you uh you've been enjoying your spring break yeah um so yes yeah, spring, spring break was great um Honestly, I spent a lot of the time studying, didn't do as much traveling as I'd like, uh, but, you know, found ways to be productive, just read a little bit, which is crazy reading for fun after reading so much for school. It's really nice to shift gears and kind of do it for fun again. Uh, that played video games, you know, just found time to unwind, which is great. Invaluable, really. I feel like everybody needs that. I know, uh, I know for, it's interesting for me, I have a bunch of books sitting on the shelf right now that I can't dare to open until after we graduate. So like props to you for getting that started already over the spring break. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. Well, I mean, I'm also, I get berated by my girlfriend because she's a big reader. She blows through, you know, 20 books every three months or so. Um, And then she's like, oh, the only time you read is for school. Like pick up a book, kid. (laughs) Learn (laughs) Like, all right, whatever, man. Tell her to read a Nolan chapter. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's funny. It's funny how the the motivation behind it works. I, we kind of like learned about it too, about like the intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, but like sometimes you'll just come across an article that has to do with like IO psychology or just business in general on LinkedIn, or whatever. You're like, oh, like I want to read that and actually like learn from it. But then it comes. Then it's like a Saturday, and you're like, oh, I have to read this article. It's like 25 <laughs> pages for class. I'm like I don't want to do this and take notes. But you just read a 25 page article on Thursday that had nothing to do with class. And if yeah. anything, the one for class has like an outcome because you're getting a, a grade or, you know, potentially being asked questions on it. Um, that might be a whole topic in a podcast for itself. I don't know. Have you ever <laughs> found yourself like trying to read articles like that and just being like that sort of dynamic? No, absolutely. I, a, a lot of, uh, so I don't really read books for fun right now, especially when I'm in school, but I do do a lot of online reading and, and um, you know, things like Forbes, a lot of The Economist, a lot of New York Times and things like that. And I think to me, I'm going to defend myself a little bit on that and defend you guys as well, is that a lot of these articles that you read about is it's new, it's novel. This is like information framed in a non-academic way that's like, oh, this is really interesting. It's an easy read. You can just kind of skim it and get all these ideas and spark these concepts that you haven't really heard before. Whereas when you're reading the same organizational psychology textbook, it's great and it's building off of each other, but like we kind of know where this is going and we're already in lecture about this and it always re- relates to things that we have learned about and things like that. So um, I like I like being able to just kind of jump all over the place and learn all these different new pieces of information, new tidbits and things that will really spark these new pathways in my brain. So I'm sure you guys are the same way. I'm sure everybody is the same way. New information is exciting, you know, so let's, I'll defend ourselves a little on that end. <laughs> You know, like a true IO psychologist pulling information from a lot of areas and trying to mm-hmm. compile it into one lesson learned, I think is a good way to think about that. Um, the One of the main reasons uh, Joe and I wanted to have you on this podcast too is like you had an unconventional path to IO um, and came back to start p- to pursue your master's degree a little bit later in life. And we wanted to kind of get your perspective on that for students out there who might be thinking the same thing or going through the same thing. Uh, so with that being said, was IO something that you always thought about doing or did you kind of come to it a little bit and think, oh, maybe I could do this? Um, or were you thinking other programs as well? Like what were your thoughts that had you jump back into IO after graduating a couple years later? So um, my path was a bit unconventional for sure. Um, I, I like to tell people that I was actually very fortunate in the sense that I always knew it was IO. I always wanted to do IO. I was always passionate about IO since you know the first time I learned about it. Really, um, I didn't really stumble upon it until my teenage years, late teens, you know, senior in high school. I want to say when I really found out about it, but that was because I was exploring uh, overlapping fields. I wanted to do something with psychology 
because I cared about people and those humanistic values, and I wanted to contribute and really move forward society. But privately, I was I was just fascinated by numbers, math, business, you know, financial markets, and things like that were where I really wanted to take my career. Um, I originally wanted to actually be a stockbroker, and so I have my, my father has an MBA in finance, my brother has an MBA in finance, my other brother is a business and marketing major, and so my whole background was always us boys talking business, whether it was over the dinner table or hobbies, and uh, growing up in that, I wanted to do that, but I cared too much about people to really want to work on Wall Street. Um, I had, uh, in high school, I actually was part of this summer program for personal finance that was on Wall Street. So I'd commute there three times a week and we learned from at the Museum of American Finance about all these different structures. And then I, I, you know, I talked to the guy that was the teacher and he was telling me like, oh man, you know, you seem like a nice kid. Don't do this work. Like don't, you don't want to work on Wall Street. Like he's like, I've worked here for 20 years and I've been miserable for 20 years. Like you don't want to do this. So <laughs> after, you know, eventually, you know, I, I spoke with him and I was like, okay, well, I like psychology. Like, what can I do with that? And he actually was the one that told me about IO psychology. So I looked into it and right away I was like, I know I want to do this. I'm guaranteed. So I was fortunate in that. My story about going back to school was a little more difficult because it was personal circumstances that didn't allow that. You know, I graduated with my undergraduate and at the time, different family things came up and I kind of had to be home. So it was more about working in the professional world, being there for the family, and then being able to get that experience in the real working environment. And then I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go back and get a master's at some point. But I said I'd give it a year, and a year turned into two, and two turned into four. And then I eventually had to really just sit myself down and say, all right, if it's not now, it's never. You know, you have to really put the pedal to the metal. And if that means working two jobs and going to school, you got to do that because it's something that you know that would make you happy and would be good for your career. So my, it, I knew I wanted to go back. It's just a matter. It was a matter of time more than anything. No, it's, it's great. That kind of thought process that you had. Um, and it's why I wanted to have you on because I remember, I forgot what conversation I was having, but it was, should you wait to get a master's in IO and like work first or should you not? Um, and I was always impatient. I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And then it was actually during our second year when I, when we have our internship and then you start learning about this stuff, I was like, this stuff just makes so much more sense now because you mm -hmm. actually have the real world experience to apply to where the first year you're still learning the things, but it's hard to like put yourself in that, I guess, like organizational mindset. Cause I mean, personally, I just, I didn't have that, that experience yet. Yeah. Um, when you came back to your degree in the various jobs that you've had, did you, like, do you think that like your perspective on the program or I guess the things you've learned changed a bit? I mean, that, that's a terribly worded question, <laughs> but uh, if, if you get what I'm saying, like, were you able no, to apply the knowledge we learned in some of your previous experiences? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I, I wish I knew a lot of this stuff um, when I was doing some of the previous jobs and roles that I had, mainly that one that you guys know about when I was the, the contractor supervisor at the, the field servicing company. Um, it was a supervisor role. And so I oversaw a lot and I oversaw people's job routes. I, they directed to me with quality control on the products. They, and then they referred to me as extra counsel when they were hiring, when they were training these people and when they were onboarding people and, um, just really building that culture with different areas that I was assigned to. So I was assigned to the Northeast region, which was Brooklyn all the way up to New Hampshire. And, you know, I'm overseeing 30 different contracting companies. I wish I had these IO principles to really learn and, and leverage when I'm in that role, because trying to put 30 different contracting companies on the same page, especially when there's areas that are like, okay, well, no one's covered this. I got to get this guy to drive three hours to do this roofing job. How do I do that? You know, just the ideas of rewards and, and punishments and, you know, building cultures of wanting to help and then in turn giving back to them and looking out for them and their best interests and protecting them from the backside of, you know, what the bankers want, what, what uh, the ownership of the company wants, what the clients need. So absolutely, it changes my perspective on how I'm in taking the information now. And uh, I, I wish I did have that prior. <laughs> Sounds like you've been studying for our OD test. Uh, <laughs> it's super fair, though, to think about that in terms of like your experience and then how you're going to 
try and make what you've learned and apply it. I think one of the best parts of our Hofstra program is that internship class that you and I have together, Matt, because we get to learn about not only our experiences and what we're learning, but the other people in our cohort and what they're learning, uh, because you get to hear the practical application of the knowledge we have. Like, have you kind of seen that idea of the practical application of IO psychology be something that can exist in multiple places? Because I know that you've had a bunch of different experiences in a bunch of different fields. So like, what, what have you seen in like the application of what you've learned in the different fields you've had throughout your career so far? Jeez. Um, really make me think <laughs> on that one. I, would, <laughs> I think that the application is undoubtedly there uh, and can be applied to a lot of different fields. I know that um, like I said, I, I unfortunately wasn't in the position of having all this information, being privy to this prior, but, you know, whether it's direct applications and things like that, uh, I had a, a role as an HR consulting intern. That's very, you know, one-to-one. -one. There was a lot of direct application to that. I talked a little bit about the project management background, but even stuff like when I'm bartending and just, you know, the ability to, to facilitate these relationships and bring together these different people from different worlds and try and, um, you know, get them to, to converse and get along with each other and, and ideally maybe even become friends or, or coworkers. I've actually a bartender for things and I've said, Oh, well, you're interested in this job. And I kind of match make with somebody that I know is in that different field. Um, and so like things like that, I know that there's a lot of like impractical applications. I, I don't know if that's the right term, but things that you can kind of apply from this field to a regular everyday jobs. And so I do find a lot of that too, but undoubtedly, I mean, if you're in, if you're in HR, then you can use stuff in the classroom very directly. It's not even things that necessarily need to be translated all the time. You can just plug in a lot of these ideas and, and models. Yeah. You could, you can use IO anywhere. Like, as I feel like as, as we're learning, um, it's not even just company or like organizational context. Like it's just, if you take the the lessons and principles of like building like a good team foundation or like leadership, um, I remember I think it was in our first OD class. Leadership was never like super interesting to me. I was like, eh, leadership. I don't know. It just never sounded that interesting to me. And then uh, Dr. Nolan started talking about what made leadership research uh, uh, more like. No, we're not going more like famous or I don't know, like more uh, interesting um, was that they started studying it for the military and like how to get good leaders in the military. And I was like, Oh wait, that's actually pretty cool. Um, and then I was like, I actually didn't never even thought about that because I'm only thinking about sitting like a leader of a team on a, in like a cubicle, not, you know, in the field. Um, so I like how you're able to kind of like find those different areas to, to, to apply. Uh, I kind of wanted to jump back real quick because you talked about finance um, MBA and something that we're kind of growing, eh, not growing as much on the channel, but IO and finance. We've had a previous episode on it that we really liked. Um, and hopefully we're going to have a couple more in the future. Uh, I wanted to get your perspective on, let's see how I could word this question. Uh, because I know you didn't want to do finance. You found like, oh, I want to work with people more. Do you think you would ever like merge the two in a way? Because we see a lot of like, it's more just like an opinion question. Um, would you ever want to be in like the financial industry and do like IO type work? Um, yeah, you can say absolutely. No. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. If I could, approach, if I could work in the financial industry or the business field, but by, by you know, still being able to use these IO principles, but more importantly, maintaining these humanistic values and really prioritizing people and human capital as, as the foundation of a thriving business. I would absolutely love to do that. It's something that furthermore, I would actually, I could see myself doing and I would like to kind of steer into um, because there's a lot of ways that you can approach being successful and making money without just, you know, without saying, all right, it's, it's all about the bottom line. You know, 100%, yeah. it, it's, it's balanced, just like IO psychology in general, it's balanced between people and between successful business. Um, and that's what drew me to this field. It's not all about one or the other. So as far as my future role, absolutely, I would love to work in any capacity dealing with, you know, financial markets, if it's relating more to people, whether that's on their own literacy, whether it's um, whether their portfolios and risk management and things like that, I can definitely see myself doing that. Um, and I do think there is a lot of market for that. 
you know, for anyone that is listening that is interested in business and finance, but likes their psycho, you know, their IO or psychology background. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot that you can do in IO and finance, and I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, when we talked with Vicky about it, it was definitely really interesting to hear about her perspective. But one thing that I thought was really cool about the conversation we had with Vicky, and I'd love to ask you about Matt. Um, in your experience in your internship during the program, you were in HR consulting. So you probably had some uh, experiences across different businesses. Would you say that you saw any like specific differences or like versus, or sorry, let me rephrase this. Would you say that you saw differences in different types of industries with the clients that you were working for um, and where you could like apply that HR knowledge that you were experiencing? Because I know like we're talking about HR and finance, it's definitely HR or IO and finance. It's a different, it's a different beast than it would be like doing IO in like, uh, in like a fun, a more fun industry, you know, like tech. Right. No, ab- absolutely. Um, as far as across industries, I don't think that that, I mean, it, because regardless of the industry, there's going to be people that have different levels of financial literacy, different levels of business acumen and things like that. I, I haven't really found it, in my limited experience. I haven't found that it's huge across different industries with huge differences um, so much as the individual person and where they sit in the company and, and what they're required to do as far as a business standpoint. You could be a food service industry, but if you're great with numbers and you can still be a data analyst, you know, um, I found that more of an impact than the industry itself would be the size of the company on, on their knowledge of financial processes and, and HR processes as well. We worked with a lot of small and mid-market companies. So, you know, down from the smallest being mom and pop type one, you know, building organizations. And I found that those are the ones that you find the biggest, it's not that they're deficiencies, but those, they have the biggest needs and opportunities to grow in terms of their knowledge of the surrounding market and the competitors because they're insulated and they're just thinking about growing their business and their brand, not necessarily worried about things like benchmarking, not necessarily worried about their standards um, in the industry at that point. They, they just, they're looking to, to grow. And when you're focusing on growth, it's very different than, uh, you know, focusing on, uh, we'll say different debt levels and, you know, return on investments and risks and things like that. Um, but that's that's just what I found again from my limited experience. Do you do you think you have a preference in like what size you'd want to work in, just from like seeing seeing the differences? Yeah, um, I know Brandon has heard this a lot in our uh, internship class where we all talk about it. Um, but for me, I my personality type definitely is attracted to the bigger the company, the better. Just because I like being go go go, I love working, you know, on, on New Yorker and you once. Uh, absolutely. I, I right now I'm doing, you know, I'm going to school and working because if I didn't have a job and I was going to school, I would be bored. You know, I've always had two jobs or two jobs in school or something like that. I've always had the need to go, go and add more. So for me personally, um, I've always looked for bigger companies in kind of a faster paced environment, but it depends on the person. You have to find the right fit. You know, we, we talk a lot about person organization fit. And if you're a more laid back person, maybe you'd be better suited to these smaller organizations that will maybe, you know, grow your skill set and really foster that feeling of community a little bit easier and everything's not so siloed. So you have to figure out what works for you and what you want to do as well. Don't don't take my word for it. Yeah, I mean, you do have a lot of experience under your belt. And I know Joe and I can both attest to your work ethic and working with you on projects in school. And I get to work with you um, in IOPSA as well which has been a pleasure all year long. Uh, So I know we've kind of like talked about a lot of different things. One thing that Joe and I wanted to talk about with you was just kind of an overall discussion about how as a student, you've seen like the use of AI, not only in like the student world, but also in uh, like your professional early career experience as well. Uh, what what are your thoughts on that? We kind of want to have like a little discussion with you about that at the end of our episode here. <laughs> Everything uh, about AI right yeah, now. Right. Everything you know. Let's <laughs> All of our professors are listening. <laughs> Everyone listening, you're about to learn everything there is to know about artificial intelligence. In five minutes, Korea. digest it down. <laughs> <laughs> um. I mean, like you said, this is all opinion. This is a discussion. You know, we're allowed to yeah. to that. But... um. In my opinion, it, it can be great. 
it's just like anything, right? I mean, it, ref works, O net, things like that. It could be a tool. And it, if you use it as a tool, it can really spark a lot of great ideas and really can help you code information in a way that's better suited for how you want to remember it, whether it's, you know, just headers and subsections and stuff like that, or maybe, you know, explaining something that you don't quite understand in, in a better way or putting in the language a little bit more clear or concisely. I think it'd be a great tool. The issue, in my opinion, with AI comes up when people start using it as a crutch, right? I mean, when we stop being capable as human beings of this higher level of thought and these the manipulation of the information in our heads that we use to, to not only create but understand these learning models and these theories and, and these concepts, if we really start using AI to just summarize and really just plug in and memorize that word for word, all we're really working on is our memory. We're not really working on understanding and we're not working on this these higher level thinking and these higher level concepts. So, uh, you know, you have to be careful with it. Like I said, it can be great, but when you lean on it too much, it's, it could be dumbing down a lot of what we're learning. Yeah, I, I, I love that part. Um, I actually, for our like internship presentation, mine's on AI in the workforce uh, because Brandon took my topic. Still a little you know, salty about <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, <laughs> great minds think alike, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I should have went first. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, but no, it's a great uh, thing you brought up because um, I remember looking into it and you're 100% right. It's if you use it, not too much, but to the point where you're not thinking and just copying and pasting um, and you start losing that ability to actually read the models, who knows, maybe in like a hundred years, AI will be able to know people's thoughts and perceptions and can integrate it into these models. And who knows if that'll ever happen. Um, but it can't now. <laughs> so if we take these outputs and, and what we give it as face value, it's, it's not going to put out exactly what we need. So we can't take it exactly as it is. You still have to exactly as you say, have that like higher critical thinking to, to, to understand what the model is actually trying to tell us. And then, you know, maybe, Oh, AI, I gave it some of this data and it can output and it, it can just speed up that, that process a little bit. So I, I, I like, I like what you, I, I you put that because it's, um, I think it is kind of becoming a crutch in some ways. And then as it gets better, it's only going to be a bigger crutch. <laughs> I have a younger brother that's just, man, he's fascinated with that, but he's finishing his undergraduate. I'm, you, I'm yeah. not going to reveal any details, you know. <laughs> but he, he, he didn't, he's not cheating or anything like that, but like to just to generate ideas and things like, oh, well, you know, to get things started, I'm going to put it into chat GPT. Like, all right, okay, but like have just start by thinking about it first, you know, just start with the <laughs> yeah. effort because whether whether it's learning, whether it's, uh, professional careers, whether it's relationships, people, friendships, effort is always where it should begin. And if you're going to start with looking for the easy way out, the payoff's never going to be great. So I, I, I don't, I don't like people starting with, with it. But I'm sorry, I got sidetracked there yeah, because you're right, undergraduate yeah, kids. You're like, oh well, all the kids in my class just use it. I don't. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I went full parent mode on. No, it's a it's a good point. You know, one thing that I kind of like to relate it to personally, um, like my dad's an artist. So sometimes like when he would get ready to do paintings or do drawings or something along those lines, he would kind of use images or pictures and try to find them to build up the creative thought process. And that's kind of how I see like the use of effectively as students in early career uh, for AI, where it's like, okay, like I can do some preliminary thinking here. An AI might be able to might be something that can give me options and I can think about these options that it's giving me for whatever the situation is, but it's just like another set of options. It's not the only choice. And I think that's yeah. where we kind of see the younger students or even students our age kind of get in trouble where it's like, okay, I can just throw this in here and get an answer, but that doesn't make it the right answer. Um, exactly. I, but I kind of like that. It's like creating a board of, th of thinking and trying to help set us up for some opportunities. I, that's kind of how I've always seen it and used it too. It's a tool and it's just oh, part of sure. the piece. It's not the whole picture. Absolutely. I mean, if you want to, you know, generate ideas and, and like I said, help facilitate that thinking, that's great, but it has to be a tool for that and it can't be a replacement for that. Um, and I do think that, that, you know, your dad being an artist is a great example of something that 
at least currently. I'm not going to say never because you never say never. Not with the way the technology is advancing. But at least currently, to me, the things that are going to remain unaffected by AI for a little while are things that are like creative pursuits. Things that really tap into these emotional uh, connections and these creative feelings and, and these innermost passions that human beings have that are really hard to capture. They're, they're you know, hard. They're not very tenable for us to understand ourselves. I mean, how do I know what song is going to be my favorite one this year? You know, what's pleasing to the year and things like that. I'm not a musician, but creatively, whatever resonates with you, you know, and that's, it's going to be difficult for, you know, chat GPT to write, you know, unless it's, a, it's like math rock or something like that, you know, you know <laughs> things that are like really based in specific formulas and rhythms. And that's cool. But, uh, you know, creative pursuits, I think, will always be very uh, human. No, it, it's a good point. And you're right. It is crazy, like, how fast it's progressing. I think ChatGPT yeah. came out or, like, was popularized 2020, right around there. I think that was, mm-hmm. like, around the year when people started, like, oh, what is this? And, like, oh, I, I can use this and use it for that. Mm-hmm. And now you have microsoft copilot that is like summarizing pdfs mm-hmm. for you and is like literally a virtual assistant on your desktop in short years um i was watching i think it was the joe rogan pod i don't know i was there's this uh, mma fighter bo nickel he was like i put a fighter into this uh into chat and i'm like asking it these questions and like formulate a game plan i'm like how long into the future in like 10 15 years can you just like and you can apply it to other contexts. Like this company did this and this and like how to just formulate a plan. And I'm just like, how long until it is just like so good? Like, do you guys think yeah. it's going to be like five years or do we have to wait like 50 <laughs> or is in like three weeks or we'd be like, Oh, chat GPT uh, can just basically get the master's degree for you. <laughs> you know, I read, I read this thing back in the day. I don't know if this is still the statistic, but it was talking about like storage and data and how it's like exponentially increasing every year. And just like look at your mm-hmm. iPhones or your Macs of like when we were in high school or like early years in college, our phones were maybe like 32 gigs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now they're like 512 gigs to a terabyte of storage. So it's like that's kind of how I feel like the the AI field's going to go just from my own perspective. I don't know, if Matt or Joe, you guys have a different perspective on that. But I see it like exponentially increasing because I feel like once you unlock one thought process, the AI then becomes the assistant to help make it better. So it's like mm-hmm. speeding up the actual like thinking around the whole idea. No, I can't take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you like you, you hit it on the head. Like the the idea. <laughs> I like I like the easy cop out. <laughs> um, but I, I I do I do agree with that. Like I mean the 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 concept of it being so exponential in, in its growth. I think that it will be. I don't I like I'm not I'm not a. I'm not preaching the iRobot gospel or anything like that, but I, I think that it, it's going to be surprising and borderline unhandleable on how quickly it grows. And it's not that we won't know how to do with it or what to manage with it, but I think even even researchers are going to be surprised at how quickly AI really compounds its growth and, and continues. Um, and Brandon, you're hitting me right in the heart talking about 16 gigabyte storage and everything. I, I, I'm all, I, before you guys sound, I used to have an iPod, uh, an iPod mini that had eight gigabytes of storage. And I thought that was everything. <laughs> like, right. It's, it's insane. It's insane at, at the rate that this is, this is going. Um, but we'll have to see. I don't want to make any predictions. I, if there's one thing that I'm not and that I am inexperienced in, it's computer science. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Matt, we we love having you on here and chatting about all these different things. I know this is kind of a taste for our listeners of what Joe and I plan to do with this podcast in the future, like having discussions. Um, but we wanted to leave here with one final question, like the question we ask all of our guests. And this is just kind of about you and your advice that you have for prospective IO students and people who are trying to get themselves into IO early career. Uh, it's like, what advice do you have for them out there um, that could help them out? So people trying to get into the field of IO or just their early career in general, you're saying? Either one. Either one. All right. So 
because it, it, it kind of changes my answer a little bit. If you're getting into both. the field of IO, to me, um, you wouldn't be in that field if you didn't care about, again, business and people. Um, and so if you're going to do IO, I would say if, if there's one thing that I have to encourage, it's, it's be passionate. There's so many different disciplines in IO and sub-disciplines in IO, and there's so many different fields that you can go into and branch out into. You need to be passionate about finding what excites you. Because if you're going to be in the workforce to motivate other people and improve their well-being in the workforce, you can't do that unless you're passionate about something and getting up and doing every day. So it doesn't matter if it's change management. It doesn't matter if it's people analytics. It doesn't matter if it's human resources. It doesn't matter if it's selection. There's a million different fields that you can look into. If you're getting an IO degree, find something that excites you and really, really pursue that. It's something that you really have to make sure that you, you do. Um, but for just people that are graduating and they're trying to figure out what they want to do, if they want to go back for a graduate degree, I think that the best advice that I've ever gotten was when I was speaking to my parents because my mom, similar to you, Brandon, she's an artist. She's someone that runs theater companies. She's a very creative person. And my dad is the complete opposite. He's a microbiologist. Math, science, business is all black and white for him. And something they both agreed on. And they never agreed on a lot, but they both agreed. They said, what you're meant to do with your life is always at the intersection of what you love and what you're good at. So if you're thinking about pursuing a graduate degree, you either pursue something that you love or pursue something that you're good at. Otherwise, you're just going to be wasting money and throwing it down a rabbit hole doing something that you don't really know what you want to do with. And it's fine for undergraduate. You're young, you're exploring yourself. But graduate's a different game. You have to have direction and you have to pursue one of those things. So that would be the advice about students thinking about going back. Yeah, it deserves a round of applause. That was, uh, that was beautiful advice, the, oh, especially thanks. the part about <laughs> passion. Uh, cry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's true. It's um, you want to make sure you're going into something that you that you really know about, um, especially for for a graduate degree. Do do ten minutes of research and just Google what IO psychology is, and make sure you know it's. I'm not just going to in the fall, I'm going to start learning some classes and I don't even know what the first class is going to be. Or listen to a couple of our episodes. That. Ah, yeah. Promo right there. <laughs> I, and the, all right. So I, I want to preface this by saying they did not pay me to say this or at all. Um, <laughs> and I know that this makes it sound like they paid me to say this, but they actually didn't. Um, I do want, I do also really endorse things like listening to you guys' podcasts and do as part of your research, really the informal discussions, because we talked earlier about just the knowledge from like that internship class and what everybody else is doing firsthand. Brando and Joe, you guys have a podcast that is exactly like that. It's great to learn about what people are doing in the field. It's great to learn about the perspectives that it's just, it's not classroom. This is what we're really learning about. This is what we're really up against. And to hear from all these brilliant minds, I mean, you guys, you got, you got Dr. Alan Church on the show and half the faculty from Hofstra and all these brilliant people. And so not as a plug, but I definitely recommend things like you guys' podcast, like doing your research online and sci boards and stuff like that, because that's that feeds into what I was talking about, about being passionate and just really wanting to learn and grow. We, we appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Foster syndrome definitely uh, kicks in every episode, so we're just happy people listen. <laughs> um, but you kind of you kind of said it for me. It's it's true. You need to have you need to have some sort of interest or passion, and not even apply that just to I O, but but to anything. You got to make sure you you know what you're getting yourself into with 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 anything in life. Um, mm-hmm. kind of gives you that first step ahead, and you have an idea of of what's to come. Um, mm-hmm. so yes, great. I think we can all uh clap on that advice. That was that was perfect, and hopefully people can take that to heart. Uh. But thank you, Cam, for for coming on and talking to us. We had a we had a great time. We had that new little segment at the end, which Brandon highlighted. We're trying to get more into those like discussion type, um, interview style things. Uh, so we trialed it today, and I thought it went great. Um, so thank you for coming on and uh, talking with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and when you guys inevitably have that huge studio and the podcast is on episode five hundred. Uh, hopefully you'll have you know people in the studio and you guys will be in person. These discussions will be even better. We'll set up a three camera shot. It'll awesome. be great. You guys will love it. We'll have you on again for that. We definitely will. Thank you so much for coming on here, Matt. My pleasure. Now you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for having me. See you, man. So another episode down. Uh, I thought that was really awesome having Matt on here. You know, we always joke about his public speaking skills in class and how great he is to kind of lead the charge of any presentation 
And of course, he came on here and killed it. So it was great to have him on here and hear about his insight and his career um, and also just getting to chat with him, you know? No, it's, it's always fun when you have like a friend on too, because like we have that already have that camarad- camaraderie, but then you also know he knows what he's talking about. So it creates like a great discussion. Um, it was similar to when we had, had uh, Manny on. Um, so overall, just like it was so much fun. Um, we already talked about it after the episode, how we'll have him on again for maybe like a longer length discussion in the future. Uh, so if you enjoyed this, stay tuned and hopefully we'll see you guys at that episode. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely want to ca- point that out that we are, we're kind of trying to transition our formatting after we graduate. And I think this was a good way for us to pilot that and see how it goes. And definitely was more fun for us. So um, stay tuned for that. And also just to highlight one more time, uh, we, we loved having Matt on here. Um, I can personally attest to working with him, his work ethic, and just his overall knowledge, uh, working with him on the IOPSA. Um, he's the treasurer, I'm the president, and we get to do a lot of work together. Um, so it's been real. It's been a real pleasure, and having him as part of my team has been something I've been really appreciative for. So having him come on here was just a full circle moment for me, for sure. Yeah, I'm not even going to repeat it. I'm just going to second what Brandon said. <laughs> I agree <laughs> with every bit of it. Uh, but thank you guys, everybody, for listening. Uh, and we'll uh, hope you guys... Catch you next week.